Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to uh, open up the broadcast to let people join. I'll give five minutes for people to join in and then I'll make a start. So good morning. Thank you very much for joining us today um, for this webinar on building back faster and better amidst COVID-19 is a green recovery possible. Um, so the government white paper on reforming the planning system focuses on speeding things up. This includes moving to a rules-based planning system to give developers greater clarity on what development is acceptable 
in which location and what the environmental assessment process and making, sorry, the environmental assessment process uh, more efficient. But how does this marry up with the forthcoming mandatory approach to biodiversity net gain in the Environment Bill? Can we speed up the process of getting a development to construction and then operation whilst not just improving the environmental outcomes, but also delivering genuine and meaningful long-term benefits for nature and people? In our webinar today, we have a panel who will discuss the risks, uncertainties, opportunities, and the green path we need to take to rebuild our economy uh, in ways that tackle both the climate emergency and the biodiversity crisis. Um, we'd like today to be uh, interactive, so I'd encourage you to use the question and answer function. So if you can pop questions in there, um, we will be going through a, a bit of a discussion in the panel, um, and we'll have a question session at the end, but please do um, pop questions into the Q&A function as we go through, um, and we'll, we'll get to those at the end. Um, yes, please use that function. So, um, <clears throat> introducing today's panel, we've got uh, Julia Baker, who is the Biodiversity Technical Specialist at Balfour Beatty. We've got Bob Edmonds, who's the Technical Director for Ecology at SRL, SLR Consulting. Um, and we've got Richard Sagar, who's uh, stepped in a, a very last minute um, from Walker Morris um, for one of his other partners. So thank you very much, Richard. Uh, we've got Tom Butterworth, who's Technical Director for Natural Capital and Biodiversity at WSP. And myself, Jason Reeves, I'm the Head of Policy and Comms at SIEM. So uh, to start off today, I'm just gonna give a quick overview of the planning reforms. Um, and then we'll get into a bit more discussion how they link with other things and the panel can have a conversation around uh, how we put, put it all together and, and how we move ahead in a, you know, building back in a green way. So we're talking about the planning for the future consultation for England, which closed in August. Um, the main um, uh, sort of claim or objective from the government on this is that the Town and Country Policy Act uh, being 70 odd years old, uh, having been amended several times, is now complex and bureaucratic and it's time for reform. Uh, the government describes this as a major overhaul um, for planning in England as a, a once in a generation uh, reform. There's three key elements here um, that I'm just going to cover in this, this very brief intro. One's around speed, speeding things up, um, the zoning proposals, and then changing to a rules based system. So speeding things up. Uh, the planning reforms aim to drastically speed up the creation and adoption of local plans, planning decisions and uh, delivery. So speed, speed, speed. Um, and a proposal to legislate to widen and change the nature of permitted development. So make those things that we uh, understand and know, uh, move them along more quickly and, and smoothly uh, with less barriers. We've heard a lot about project speed and that response um, to COVID-19, building back the economy. Um, we've heard about Build back, building back better and a green recovery. And we've had some very good things said from government and the prime minister at times. We've also had the unfounded new counting delays comment, which is unhelpful. Um, and there's a very definite commitment from government to invest in infrastructure as well. So the zoning proposals. So um, the proposals for zoning would be incorporated to local plans puts more onus on local planning authorities and gives them much shorter timeframes uh, to bring forward local plans as well. Um, and the general idea though is that everything would be zoned into three different areas. So growth, renewal or protected. Um, and I will go through each of those quickly um, now. <clears throat> so growth zones are suitable for substantial development. Substantial development though isn't defined, but the government do say they in the, in the proposal paper that that would be defined. So there'd be a definition for that. And it includes land suitable for comprehensive development, including things like uh, new towns, uh, urban extensions, and redevelopments of brownfield sites. Um, and that uh, these areas would have outline approval for development uh, in the local plans. The one nod to nature we get here is around uh, flood risk, but that's about as much as we get. Uh, renewal zones suitable for development as well, um, cover existing areas, but on a much smaller scale. Um, talk about the gentle densification, something else is not uh, defined. So it's generally around infill low and um, to some extent brownfield, and then smaller developments around say villages uh, in or next to, so infill again. Uh, also a, a statutory presumption in favor of development here as well. Um, 
the little nod we get to nature in this one is around residential gardens where local authorities would be able to um, resist that or, or have an option there. And then protected zones. So ideally um, uh, the area for nature and biodiversity, they'd be protected under particular environmental or cultural characteristics undefined at this stage. Um, and then we get this um, sort of odd uh, collection of uh, greenbelt AMBs, conservation areas. So different designations for uh, things like amenity, landscape, biodiversity, all sort of lumped together and gardens, um, sort of unhelpful. Um, uh, yeah, so it includes areas of open countryside outside of those already that would have been in growth and renewal. So there's some um, uncertainty there. Um, and these would be defined at the national level with uh, local designation as well, but using the national policy and labeled obviously in local plans so that they're clearly signposted. So a rules-based system. So the current situation um, isn't rule-based, it's discretionary, it's a case-by-case -case basis, um, and government wants us to move to a rules-based system for planning. Uh, their argument is that the English planning system is an exception internationally and suggests that this increases the cost of development um, and that there's a major risk for developers and it adds to their costs in that decisions are often challenged and overturned. So the proposal is that we would move to a rules-based system um, that isn't based on a case-by-case -case assessment um, where government would set out these rules at a national level and then they could be applied locally through local plans. And the idea is that local plans would be significantly shorter and simpler as well than um, uh, removing some of the uh, hurdles for developers. Um, SIEM, obviously, we responded to the consultation earlier in the year. Um, some of our views on this are that simplification isn't necessarily a bad thing. The planning system is very old, um, but it does need to be joined up and thought through. Um, and some of the concerns we have with this is that um, well, one major aspect of it is that there's not much thought being given to biodiversity or nature in it. There's a few sort of bits added in here and there, but they're not really joined up and they're not really thought through. The other thing we're going to get on to today is how joined up they are uh, with other things going on at the same time. So the Environment Bill is a good example. We've got biodiversity again, nature recovery networks. There's a new amendment on species and site strategies. And then from the Agriculture Bill, we've got environmental land management schemes. At the moment, it doesn't look like... Uh, these things have been thought through as to how they will overlay with each other. Um, the consultation is very much data driven as well, much with as with um, many things with government. Now we're moving in that direction. That's fine, but they do need to be ground truth. And we need to remember that best available data may still be poor data. Uh, monitoring and enforcement is obviously a major concern for us. Um, and there is uh, a notion in the consultation and the uh, proposals around strengthening enforcement powers and sanctions. Um, but as with all of these things, we know monitoring enforcement is one of those things that comes at the end. Does it always happen? Is there funding for it? Who's doing it? Um, so it's still a concern there. And then our other major concern is around local planning authorities and then being under-resourced um, without expertise and not really having capacity to deliver this. So they certainly need help there. So um, we know there's an argument for change that we, we have to climate emergency, there's a biodiversity crisis. Um, governments declared that, SIMES declared that, and numerous local councils have declared that. And we know we need to change quickly. There is an urgency here. So how do we achieve a green recovery and build back better? And I will pass over to Julia uh, and we can get this discussion going. Thank you. Yes, and good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to be with you here. And many thanks to my panel for joining us. So biodiversity net gain, development that leaves biodiversity in a better state than before. And that, that requires a different way of thinking, planning, designing, and building our development. And it's really important to notice and talk about and acknowledge that different approach because net gain is not business as usual and let's run the metric and make sure the numbers tot up. It is that different approach where biodiversity net gain is a core deliverable, a core part of that development right from the start. Now that different approach has its origins in a very grassroots way within industry. And it's been extraordinary to see individuals up and down the country having that change. 
but now is the right time. There is variation, there's inconsistency. So now is the right time to bring in the Environment Bill. And as Jason said, the Environment Bill, the mandatory approach to biodiversity net gain is giving us that level playing field of the numerical definition of the minimum of 10%, the 30 year timeline and other factors as well. There's still uncertainty there, but we know the mandatory approach to biodiversity net gain is coming. And then we have these planning reforms and we have this incredible opportunity as we emerge from COVID-19 to really set the scene here. But how's this all gonna fit together? And we will be discussing the first one with Bob. So Bob, the first of these key themes, so the key themes, speeding things up, and then we'll go to the, to the different zones of development, <clears throat> and then we'll go to a rule-based system. It's a fair question, right? You know, okay, I'm not gonna get into the whole pesky Greg Chris and Newt discussion, but um, as a contractor, you know, we do spend quite a lot on consultants. Can you speed up the biodiversity net gain assessment? That's a very fair question, Julia, and um, yeah, and I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to talk with with you all about about this topic. I think it's um, it's an interesting one. Obviously, everybody's always keen to see that we can move forward a bit quicker um, with the way that projects run. Um, I, I've given this bit of thought, and I, we, we've banded around quite a few um, B-based slogans recently. So we've got build back better. We've got build, build, build. And so I've got my own, and that's what we need to do is to bake in biodiversity right from the beginning. Okay, Ooh, so that's, that, good, that's the important thing we need to do. It's like if nobody goes away with anything other than your kind of, yeah, political slogan for the day, we need to just make sure that all of our, um, that the start of the process is, has got ecologists standing beside the developers and their design team, and they're thinking about ecology right from the beginning. That's how we're going to make things move quicker. Um, those are the clients that I think will be on the front foot when it comes to developments and understanding how important um, the approach to biodiversity net gain is going to be for their future plans. Um, so, so I think there are other things that are there to, you know, as well as just having ecologists involved earlier on, there are other tools that we have at our disposal that can really help us, um, help us not just, not just deliver um, better quality projects, but hopefully uh, and better for um, biodiversity and for the environment, um, but also get those projects um, through the system quicker. So um, one of the one, some of the technology um, that's um, developed and has changed in recent years is going to really help us. So we have uh, we have the opportunity now to collect good quality data sets using remote sensed information um, quite a lot of um, organizations are now flying drones um, over de potential development sites and using that to inform their habitat based assessments that will be really useful is a lot quicker than having field survey work done early on we're also using techniques like edna so that's become um, really well established used for great crested newts so that means you get quicker definitive results often in a, a wider um, survey period than you would do otherwise. So that's a really useful tool for us to use. And alongside eDNA, there's good quality kind of spatial data approaches that we can use. So modeling biodiversity data, like species distribution information. And we're already seeing that kind of coming, coming into um, policy approaches. So in England, Natural England have developed their district licensing approach. And that takes a species distribution model um, to try and inform where the best place to mitigate for newts are. So that can help things quicker and not just quicker, but for clients and developers to understand what they're signing up for and what they need to know about before they've got all of the detailed ecological baseline information. So, I mean, there's other, um, other aspects out there as well. We've got, um, oh, as you've already mentioned, good metrics um, available now, which can really help um, give us a uh, that can really help with with kind of understanding things early on in the feasibility stage. Um, so um, and not just biodiversity net metrics, but also metrics around ecosystem services, which helps play to some of the points that Jason raised earlier there about about um, alleviating flood flood risk, for example. 
So just in, in terms of speeding things up, there, there's obviously some opportunities there. So I, th I think what you're saying is, you know, what's really interesting, the main thing, you know, if you want to speed us up, talk to us early, plus all these technology aspects that are coming through, and particularly biodiversity net gain is that habitat focused. So there's opportunities, but what are the risks and what are those red lines where, you know, you need boots on the ground and, you know, we, we are talking about ecologists who, who you know, um, you just need to get out there. So there's the good stuff, but what are there any red lines that we need sure, to draw? There's absolutely, it's really important that we're cognizant of the risks that are there in, an, in, in some of these approaches that we're, um, I mean, my first thought is that, you know, biodiversity net gain and our, our general approach to biodiversity needs to be driven by good quality data we've got much better data now in 2020 than we had 10 or 20 years ago but there are still some pretty enormous gaps there both in terms of you know um, species distribution hab we still don't have a decent quality habitat map of the of great britain for goodness sake i mean you know there's so much that needs to be done um but we need good quality data and that information needs to be collected by specialists and interpreted and assessed by specialists, ecologists experienced in what they're doing. Um, I, I have a slight concern that um, with the availability of tools and the fact that they're free, free and easy to get hold of that there might be non-specialists who think that they can run away and do this on the on their own. And, and, and I would say, you know, you need to have that um, specialist uh, working alongside you and making sure that you don't miss um, miss something important. And is there um, a, a sort of a, a trade off between, you know, getting in there really, really early and, and I'm certainly lucky, you know, I, I do get those lines on the Google map and say, oh, Julia, you know, what does this look like for net gain? And I, I, I do love that, you know, that's an opportunity to start it early, but, but I'm very, very careful. And you, you know, in that moment, you, you have maybe have to go on the worst case. So I normally run different options, you know, like this could be could be a worst case option, which is obviously best case for biodiversity or, you know, whatever that might be. For a developer, getting us in really early, are there trade-offs to then looking at net gain down the line? Um, I guess I guess there might be some, you know, inevitably uh there, if you if you're looking at the, if the, the ecologist is in early and is making judgments with a limited data set then they're inevitably going to well they should be drawing using the precautionary approach in those um, in that first stages and you may find that that through that precautionary approach that there's um that we that, that actually there's more there's more space in the future as the divide design develops that that you could have more space for for development for example but um i think i think on the whole it's much more important that we get yeah have a good have a good look first early on at feasibility stage and then um yeah and then as as, as the dev design develops um you can start to see where there are areas to um to compromise or or, or get better better quality biodiversity out at the end of the day so okay so speeding things up lots of opportunities there and i get asked that question a lot julia what's the quick win what's the easy win with biodiversity net gain and i generally say ask us early because then you know you kind of like you were saying you speed up down the line technology technology is definitely great it still tends to be with the big companies at the moment so for the you know for the smaller scale projects and everything like that there, there there's a line there but also like i think you're saying there are lines in the sand you know there are those moments that you can't speed up and you certainly need that and as an industry we should we should stand firm on that absolutely and i don't you know i mean it, 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 I, I find it amazing that we're still having um conversations about about survey periods um when they haven't actually changed much in in the in the 20 years i've been in the industry and it's like you know don't don't come to me and ask for for, for high quality baseline survey work in november because because i'll still not be able to do it in april till april and i never have been so so the, the, that that kind of understanding can can really help i think yeah yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so let's move on to our, our second point then. So we looked at speeding things up. Now there are these zones, and Richard, if we can we can bring you in here. And Richard, thank you so much for stepping in last minute. We don't know that much about these development zones, but we know a little bit that Jason's gone through. What's your take on just how they would work and how they might work with biodiversity net gain? Thank you, um, and good morning, everybody. Um, I think the first 
thing to talk about is the growth zone. Um, and really the conversation needs to be more fo focused on growth and renewal than protect. Growth is when it's baked in into a plan, an area where you're going to have in effect an outline planning permission. So I'm, I'm gonna borrow again Bob's point. If you bake in what is effectively an outline planning permission, you've really got to know at that stage in plan making what it is you're going to do in terms of biodiversity, how much is going to be on site, how much can be off site. If off site, where's the clarity of where, what, and how it can be delivered? And these are all things that I think need to be assessed right at the early stage of plan making in order to define an allocation which is akin to an outline planning permission. And you will know from the amount of data that's needed to determine an outline planning permission in terms of the impacts, offsetting the impacts or compensating, mitigating, uh, or avoiding in the first place, of course, to use the, uh, the hierarchy that we have in the framework at the moment in paragraph 175. So the key is to get that right at the beginning. There is a massive amount of work to do to get that right at the beginning and to test that you've got it right at the beginning. And I, I'll just move on briefly to <clears throat> the other zone that's worth mentioning. Renewal, smaller scale, infill development, um, potentially throwing up very similar issues, but on a smaller scale of development. But at the same time, the likelihood of actually having the data and the information to judge the impact on these smaller, more ad hoc developments where there will be a presumption is even more acute because whilst it might well be possible to gain data and understanding to work out what's going to be on site or off site and how off site is going to be funded and delivered for a large project that's in a growth area such as an urban extension it is much more uh, difficult simply as a matter of resource if nothing else to be able to work out how to deal with those similar it may be smaller scale issues because of the smaller sites but there may be millions of them across the country frankly and how do you get the data to be able to make a judgment about those in the first place and how much of it is pushed back to decision making? And of course, if you've got a presumption, it's also broadly akin to an outline. It's not quite as powerful if it's a presumption in favor of development. How then does the detail feed in later? It's a rhetorical question and the rules will be critical and of course being a lawyer lawyers like everybody else we like rules we like to see where we're going with it so on-site off-site sufficiency of information baking it in at the beginning of the allocation and working out how you deliver it yeah and it's it's tricky isn't it so we've got the thing about speeding up the assessment so there, there's there's things that you can do to get a certain level of data but then you need those boots on the ground and you need the outline surveys often when I'm working with um, really early stages, there are so many different options of a development that, you know, I will have equally as many options for biodiversity net gain. So, so I wouldn't want to say this is the one, you know, because it will change. And even through detailed design, when you get on site, that there are things that are going to be different and things that are going to influence the net gain design. How do you see that balance working its way through? We don't know the detail of how the white paper is going to move this on, but I, I would suggest that there needs to be uh, not quite the full equivalent of an outline planning permission because there is still, even at plan making stage for a large urban extension, so much still to be understood about a site and how you're going to approach it. So I think there needs to be built into the system when we learn more about how the white paper evolves uh, uh, and what it really means. Uh, a, a second more detailed check to get the finer grain of, of, of how you deal with, with ecological matters and biodiversity matters on a site for development. It really needs that subsequent check, but that isn't apparent in the white paper at the moment. It isn't written out in the white paper in that way. It's difficult to see how, how you do refine the information gather more information uh, and, and get to the point where, you know, with, a, with an outline planning permission in the traditional sense now, 
you would expect at the point of getting an outline that you would know the parts of the site that you cannot develop. You would have a very good understanding of the parts of the site that you can develop. You would have a good understanding of those bits you're going to leave alone. What are you going to do with them? And if you're talking about uh, some compensatory provision, is it monetary entirely? Uh, is it clear where the money is going to be spent and what good it is going to do in terms of compensating or, or offsetting, to use the slightly more old fashioned term? Mm. Um, it, it just seems that there needs to be another step in the process that doesn't exist in the white paper at the moment. So if you were, I suppose, given the uncertainties in the white paper and given the unknowns that we have, um, if, if you were mapping that process out, uh, what kind of what, what would you want to see? Sorry, Julia, I, I missed the opening part of I think I've got a poor reception. If you, given that there, there is uncertainty, so we know there's going to be these growth areas, but there's uncertainty about how that would work. What would your advice be for the government? I think you've got to move the boundary a little bit between what has traditionally been a reserve matter and what has traditionally been an outline. Uh, so, so that there is more still to be determined at reserve matter stage. Traditionally, we have uh, in the current system, uh, you cannot go back and revisit matters of principle at reserve matters stage. At reserve matters stage, you should already have from the outline uh, a great deal of information about how uh, key matters can be resolved. And, and if, if that can be, if the, the, the boundary between where those two uh, overlap with each other can be moved slightly so that there are things at reserve matters stage that might traditionally have been said to be in points of principle for outline, but can still be determined and still be considered with more information. Yes, yes. So recognising early is good and having that, but things are going to change down the line. Yes. Yeah. And a refinement of understanding of a site. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And keeping on that theme of... We, we've Julia, got just, these... be... Sorry, yeah. just before you move on, I think Tom wanted to make a point here. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask a question really of Richard, if that's okay, Julia. I'm going to jump in. Um, <laughs> uh, this, I think this is a really interesting point because if we are putting more information forward up front uh, in these areas of development, does that then mean, or do you read the paper to suggest that that means actually the local authority are going to have to do a ton of work that at the moment sits with the developer? in order to get that information ready to say, yes, this is our growth area and this is what's required from it? Yes, but I think the expectation from listening to comments made by various people who were on the panel producing the white paper is that the local authority would put some of that burden back to the developer. So if they are thinking in the plan making process of uh, allocating a, a, an area of land for growth, let's say uh, a major urban extension. And that site has already been promoted by a, a developer who has the ability and probably deeper pockets and resource to do a great deal of the work. And that work should be encouraged by the authority of the developer in order to uh, allow them to assess it rather than create it in the first place as part of the allocation process. That seemed to be the answer from um, Christopher Kakowski QC, who was on the panel when he was asked a similar point. Now that's not my answer, that's my assessment of what they are thinking. Okay, that sounds like two assessments by the local authority instead of one for that development then. One, one at the earlier stage to say, have they, has the developer done the work that they need to do to identify it as a growth area? And then the second one, once they put forward their proposal for the development. Uh, possibly. I mean, normally you have a very simple call for sites type approach right at the beginning when people are invited to put forward sites. I think at that stage, it won't simply be, will you have a look at my site? It will be, will you have a look at my site? Because here is a really well thought through assessment uh, of the site, not just on, on biodiversity matters in fairness, on probably every conceivable development topic. 
Um, of course, then the burden switches to the authority to look at that information and to appraise it and assess it. So there may not be boots on the ground uh, obtaining it, surveying the site, taking the various um, uh, bits of information that already exist uh, and adding to it from further survey. But I think they will have to appraise it very carefully and in much more detail than has hitherto been the case. Thank you. And thank you, Julia, for letting me jump in. No, I was going to, well, I'm going to ask um, you and Bob to come in on this piece. So we, we've got these zones, we, you know, particularly the grey zone, and we've got DEFRA's um, spatial hierarchy for biodiversity net gain. Now, out of everything with the, the mandatory approach to biodiversity net gain, the one thing that gained most consensus was the focus of biodiversity net gain on or nearby the site. And that's one thing that you know all the stakeholders um, were sort of most aligned with. So my question's to you, right? We know even at the moment before the Environment Bill, developers are already changing behavior. We're seeing that already. We're seeing that um, some developers doing it very well in terms of shifting their development and designing their development with biodiversity net gain on site. But we are seeing inappropriate ways where we've just got to squeeze that green stuff in to make it fit on site. And I think part of that is the uncertainty and the risk, because if you go off site, there's not offset banks popped up or anything like that. How knowing that we, we might have these growth development zones fit in and there's this apparent conflict with the, the DEFRA's approach to the biodiversity net gain, what would you want to see you know, happen with these various growth zones and how it would fit with biodiversity net gain? Tom, let me start with you. Yeah, okay. So uh, there are examples already where land allocation has been identified by local authorities, so uh, allocated for development. And uh, in those sites, um, somebody has gone out and done a high level biodiversity net gain assessment um, at the outset to inform that land allocation that site, so that um, those sites, uh, we then understand if you develop that site out and the development is uh, covering a certain proportion of that, we've got a certain proportion of green space in and a certain proportion of gardens, what is the additional requirement needed to deliver biodiversity net gain? And then those local authorities may well set up a bank to deliver that, those additional units nearby, as perhaps as a country park or something like that. And that allows a very uh, clear way forward for the developer because they know when they're coming in that they're gonna have to deliver uh, X number of units on site and then pay a certain amount for the offsite uh, country park. It also means that that country park can be placed close to the development so that those people uh, living in those houses or impacted by that development can benefit from that country park. Um, and for the local authority, it means that they can be certain that uh, they can open up that development with an uh, easy way through for net gain. Now, that's possible, but this is where my question to Richard was really coming from, because what that means is somebody going out from the local authority or, or perhaps as Richard suggests from the developer and actually doing that assessment to identify that baseline starting point before you even have allocated that site formally for development. And then also identifying that compensation site. And the example I'm thinking of, I know that there were examples in Teambridge and, and, uh, and elsewhere, but that can work really well, but it is quite a lot of work to get that up and running. Yes, does, yeah. that, does that make sense? It, it does, is that, is that one back for me? Yes, go on then. Um, or, or at least briefly as, a, as an introductory. Um, it, it seems to me that when you're looking at off-site sites, um, there are two ways of approaching it. The developer may actually promote as part of their own case an off-site site that they have control over. Mm. The local authority may promote an off-site site that they have control over. If there is no control in terms of land control, then there is an issue about how you actually uh, deliver. It could involve compulsory purchase, simply identifying a site and then putting a policy allocation on it doesn't necessarily provide the ability to deliver. 
Um, but but your, your point, Tom, I think, was who, who does the work to work out the baseline, to work out the opportunity for improvement um, and, and the realism of improvement? Um, it's going to put a lot of pressure back on the authority, unless to the extent on the very largest schemes, and this won't be the smaller ones, the developer can, as I said earlier, assist in doing some of that to make a case in part of its submissions and representations early on in the plan making process. Yeah, exactly. And this is where I think that the, you know, the real risks come in. We know with the Environment Bill, they talk about boosting local planning authority resources, but that was for the Environment Bill, that wasn't for this. You know, and, and we're now already compounding biodiversity net gain on local planning authorities where many don't have the ecologist or the resources plus these additional planning reforms and something's going to give. And, it, and it's having that, that point to start with. And just quickly, though, before Bob, just in case your computer um, uh, beats you out and then you have to come back in. Um, so we'll come back to you, Bob, if, if you do get cut out. I want to finalise that point on the growth areas and then we'll move to Tom for the rule based planning. Growth, to me, reinforces the disconnect between people and nature. You know, this is about emerging back from COVID-19, where I speak to so many people and they have found local green spaces that they never knew existed. You know, and people don't forget that now. You know, we've got this moment to connect with nature. And personally, that's quite important to me and how we think about net gain. How, what would you, what would you want that growth zone to be rather than let's grow development here and, and really thinking about the, the role that net gain can play with that? I think it's got to be um, holistic in terms of built form and non-built form from the beginning. I think the, the, the implication from the white paper is, is slightly different. And I think there is a disconnect between that and the, um, uh, and the whole biodiversity net gain piece. Um, the implication from the white paper seems to be, well, pay, payment of money for something to be done somewhere uh, that will offset, that will deal with the loss plus gains, um, will be the panacea, will be the answer. And, and I can't see that being uh, an appropriate approach because you'll just end up with um, large amounts of growth, which might be a good thing in itself. It's meeting an objective, but large amounts of growth that could be otherwise a bit of a green desert there is no green it, it's it's all development um, it would inevitably have its own areas of green space you would expect but green space manufactured to be part of the usable open space of a development is not the same as as biodiversity yeah exactly green not space in every respect. manufactured exactly and just um before we finally move on to the rules-based system bob is there any final points you wanted to make well, on on the zone bit yeah so i think i think i just to pick up on one of the things tom mentioned there about um what well, you were both talking about about um off, uh biodiversity net gain sites being located close to developments i think some of that's going to fall back onto local authorities and making sure that any compensation is ecologically meaningful and that does mean so that's probably the phrase that i keep coming back to it's not about where it is it's about whether it delivers what it's meant to do and whether it can be can be put in place for the for the long term and also that it fits in well with with what the stakeholders want to see so i think if they get those two things right those are in my view more important than exactly where it is if you get those two bits right then i think i think it's it's more likely to be effective for biodiversity which brings us on nicely to the rules-based system. So, Tom, we don't know much about what these rules will be. Personally, I love a good set of rules. And, and the thought of having rules for biodiversity net gain is, is delightful, I have to be honest. You know, we've got these principles in, in industry. No, let's turn them into rules. But if, if we're looking at a planning reform and we're looking at rules for that, what would you want to see with biodiversity net gain? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so firstly, just you're right, the, the rules are not clear at the moment. We've the, the suggestion is we move to a rule based system rather than uh, a, a policy based system. Um, 
so that that suggests uh, uh, something where the rule is uh, either we've passed or we've failed or we've delivered against that rule or we haven't, rather than a, a policy that allows flexibility and, and, and change um, at a local level. Um, so, I, so firstly, before we, before I just want to say one thing before that. I think there's a really interesting point here that, firstly, this is apparently a once in a generation uh, change to the planning system, which um, I think that was also said in 2010 when the MPPF was updated uh, and then published in 2012. So it's it's interesting to see that once in generation opportunities come around about once every eight years, which uh, is certainly speeding something up. Um, uh, and then we've got this ambition to replace the entire corpus uh, of, of plan making law. Now that is audacious, isn't it? I mean, the entire corpus, would we ever do that with any other part of our legal system? Say, okay, we're gonna replace everything. Um, I'm not sure we would. And also I'm not sure that this really is going to do that. So, and this, bear with me for a moment because this will come back to these rules because we may well see a radical shift in the Town and Country Planning Act. It may be completely changed, completely new name, new branding, new, new whole legislation but that doesn't mean that all of the environmental legislation or all of the uh, health and well-being legislation or all of the other acts that are around this and feed into that town and country planning act will have changed i don't believe that this white paper its ambition is to change all of those other laws and the reason the town and country planning act has been updated so many times and the mppf was only updated last year, wasn't it? 2019, the most recent update. The reason those updates are happening is because of that other law in part, you know, the habitat regulations coming in and so on. So we've already got a whole set of legislation that needs to be part of this and will then inform the rules or policy or whatever we call it. So, so we don't know what these rules are. And yet we've already got a set of rules there that says, well, we're not, we're still going to have to meet our habitat regulations requirements, we're still going to need to meet the requirements uh, that are set out within the Environment Bill and so on. So those could form potentially part of those rules. Um, our ambition for net zero carbon could form part of those rules, but we really don't know. So there's a big unknown there. Then if we come back to biodiversity net gain, um, I think there's a real opportunity here because biodiversity net gain is mentioned in the white paper. It's really clearly set out that that's an ambition. They also talk about net gain in a more broader sense and and, and a positive impact on beauty. And I think, um, as an aside, having a rule based on beauty is a really tricky one, isn't it? Because frankly, uh, isn't it in the eye of the beholder anyway? Um, but uh, biodiversity net gain perhaps does leap into that position where we can have a rule about it. We can have a rule and the Environment Bill will set out a requirement for all development under the Town and Country Planning Act to deliver biodiversity net gain, a simple rule. Um, we could equally have a rule that said every development has to meet its environmental requirements under the habitat regulations. Now, the, the subtlety underneath that is that that's a lovely, simple rule, isn't it? The detail underneath that is going to be just as complex as it is now. Um, we're not going to remove all of that subtlety around whether, uh, you know, how we're dealing with the newts or what we've got to do for the bats and, and so on and so on. That's all going to still be there. So we can have a simple rule, but that's just covering up the complexity underneath it potentially. Biodiversity net gain does also allow us to start talking about this really early on and, and speed some things up. So this links up with the work that we've already heard about, about speeding things through the process um, and also these different zones or areas. Um, we could do these biodiversity net gain assessments early. We could allow that to form part of the rule to say, yes, we can then define this as a growth area and allow uh, growth in that area. But there's this balance between detailed information early on uh, and, and the work to get that up front and clear uh, or less information early on, meaning that we can speed things through more quickly, but having greater risk later on in the process, which is what you were really talking about at the start of this, Julia, 
greater risk to that development that something's going to come up that we've missed. Suddenly we found that there's the horrid spider uh, is found on this site and suddenly we have to change development because it's the, it's just the only site in the UK that it's found or whatever it might be. Now that, that I think that, that's probably not the best example because we know where that spider is, but, but those types of things will come up and, and we mustn't let this idea that this rule-based system is going to solve all of that, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think it will. I think, I think that's such a valid point. The, 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 the wording has been a rule-based system to provide clarity, to provide certainty, you know, all of those aspects, whereas we're still dealing with nature and we're still dealing with the complexities of changing design and uncertainties and things you can get on site. So are you saying that, that there's a risk that it will... I suppose there's a risk that we're, we're promising the simplicity of solving that those pesky great crested newts when actually it just requires really good upfront data collection ecologists from the start and a comprehensive approach. Yeah, I mean, if we were able to go out and do all of the survey work that we do at the moment um, uh, as part of the development project upfront and then identify those growth areas, great, then we can speed through that de development really easily because we've got that level of information and we can use the stuff that Bob was talking about around uh, eDNA, remote sensing and so on to inform that and help build that. But that work still needs to be done somewhere. Yeah, it's yeah. still needed in order to meet all of that wider legislation that we've already got, whether it be the Environment Bill, Habs Regs and so on, all of the other pieces. Those aren't going to go away just because we rewrite the Town and Country Planning Act. And I, th I think the, the rule piece for me when it comes into biodiversity net gain is, you know, is is about that that clarity and what that 10 percent is. You know, so it's not being allowed to swap ponds with trees because pom ponds are pretty quick and easy to get your units and, you know, providing that structure as well, because even I see this, you know, even with that 10 percent mandatory approach, there's layers underneath that. And what developers that I see really need a clear understanding is not, Julia, are you making this up? Or, you know, is, is having that very strong ruled and structured approach so they know that right from the start. And, you know, so much at the moment, I see these brilliant, brave ecologists having those patient discussions with taking developers. And, you know, it's understandable, but taking developers through that uncertainty piece. And having that set out from the start, what do we mean by, you know, true biodiversity net gain might help. I absolutely agree. I can't see that being held within this new legislation personally, because I think that's quite a lot of detail. I think there yeah. might be a requirement for 10% net gain, but the detail about what that actually means and making sure that we meet those detailed rules around like for like or better and so on. Uh, it, it, we're not going to get it. We're not going to get in the detail um, in, in that. I don't think in that overarching legislation so we'll see so 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 uh, you know especially if we're not going to if we're aiming for a shorter more succinct piece of policy or legislation which is seems to be the ambition exactly um, so final points and then um and then we've got a couple of questions coming in can i ask you all of the panel members okay we, we know we've got biodiversity net gain on this side we've got the planning reforms and the uncertainty something's going to change and for you, two questions. What do we truly need to, to work on for an, a, a green recovery? Um, Bob, can we start with you? Sure, hi there. Right, sorry, yes, I've, I've had to rejoin on my phone. I think, um, I think one of the main things there is, is around capacity in the profession of ecology. I think we're, that's probably my key, my main takeaway there is more ecologists doing more high quality work will help us help us answer these questions and deliver good good evidence to create better better places and better development richard yeah um it's it's to repeat a point from earlier it's all about getting the best knowledge and the best understanding up front as soon as possible because it's going to end up being baked into plan making is going to end up being very critical to the beginning of the process because the end of the process won't produce the right results without it. Tom. Uh, I think um, that we need to 
build nature into places in a way that we haven't been doing to date, which means taking more space for development to allow for that green infrastructure and biodiversity to be an integral part of our built environment so that we can deliver flood relief, improvements to air quality, decreasing uh, the, the heat island effect, as well as biodiversity net gain. And that means dissolving this line between this is a growth area, this is a protect area. We need to actually build in a way that, in, that allows both of those things to coexist, which is a completely different view from where we are at the moment with this paper. Okay, and so practical take homes that people listening can can start today. If, you, if you'd have to give practical advice for people on what can they do to help this green recovery, Bob? I guess I, I'm, I'm making the assumption that the bulk of the people on the call will be professional ecologists and members of SAEM. I would probably advise them to kind of get in touch with their get in touch with their clients now and, and their potential clients and talk to them about, about how important it is to get these, get these things done, done early. Yes, yes. So that client engagement piece and working yeah. your way through that, which can be hard work. I've had many a conversation that, that um, went absolutely nowhere, but then you get that one conversation that makes a difference. Richard. I'm going to approach it from a slightly different point of view, from a developer's point of view, because it's relevant to everybody. But if a developer is looking at something, uh, one of the first questions, it seems to me, is how much am I going to put on site and how much am I going to put off site? What's the best balance? And if I need off site, then what and where? Because I may, I may need to get into other land alongside the area that I'm intending to develop. And the sooner I know that, and the sooner I can get a position on it, the better. Tom. I, I think uh, both Richard and Bob have made very good points. And to me, I'm just gonna reinforce the point they've made. Whether you're a developer, whether you're the local authority ecologist or in a consultancy, it's about that really early engagement to identify what's on site, what's needed, and how you can deliver the best outcomes on that development for biodiversity and the local people and so on. That, that early engagement is, and that early insight into what's on the land is crucial. Jason, in, in a final kind of final moment, um, I know that um, I think there's been um, a, a pretty good question that's come in. Would you mind kind of taking us through that question? Hmm. So we've, we've got a couple of questions. Um, let's go through the one from Louise first. So, uh, well, thanking the panel, and then um, talking about the ten percent gain and whether there might be an opportunity to have different uh, mandatory percentages for different growth zones. My understanding is it's going to be ten percent across the board, but we can have a conversation about that. Um, and whether biodiversity net gain needs to be as local as possible. I think. I mean, before I open it up, I think I think this comes back to that um, that growth area, and the concern that I have is that it you know it will get that disconnect even more so. You know, as we emerge from COVID nineteen, never before have people had that connection with nature on you know, and, and just even with their home. And I'm speaking with people who are now um, you know absolutely going out every day, putting on bird feeders, and you know just little changes like that, and you know that that wording of the growth zone and what that brings in um, is that concern and I think we've got to stand even more firm on the promises of the mandatory approach to the biodiversity net gain to deliver net gain locally as possible. Shall I come in, uh, Julia, um, uh, jump in on the biodiversity, the 10% in different growth mm. areas? So my understanding is that the 10% within the Environment Bill is the minimum, so that's the starting point. So it's absolutely for local authorities to set their targets uh, as they see fit. And some are setting targets that are higher than 10% uh, to start with everywhere. And some are being specific by location. So I know that some places that have um, garden villages or, or whatever we might call them are setting higher targets at 25%, for example. So there's no reason why different areas could have different targets. Having said that, if you've got a protect area, uh, 
you're already starting from quite a high baseline. So a 25% increase on something that's already quite good could be much more challenging than a, a higher percentage in the area that's a growth area where you might be starting with lower biodiversity. But that doesn't mean that you can't set those different targets. Julia, we're, we're, we've just about run out of time, but we've got one last question that I, th I think would be really important for us to actually uh, have a stab at. So from Alison, we've got, what advice would you give to local planning authorities who are starting their local plan reviews and allocating sites now um, in terms of data and survey needed, but they don't have an in-house ecologist? Where better they start? Good, I would suggest, so Jason, I think perhaps a good, a good way to start would be for them to look at collating together um, good quality spatial data from other sources. So even if they don't have in-house ecologists, they must have spatial, um, uh, spatial um, specialists in GIS. There's lots of good quality data out there and actually pulling that together would probably help. And they might not have their own in-house ecologists, but they might have a local Natural England team and they might have um, a local wildlife group or trust or nature conservation partners and i've seen i've seen the real magic happen when there's that collaboration across the piece and you know bringing those people together what do we want for nature in this patch and remembering that biodiversity net gain is only making things better we're not making things the best that we can be so having that set out and having as many people around the table set out that vision, um, I think will be the best thing. So reach out, collaborate, it, it can often be a good way. I think that's a really great point to end on. So, um, <clears throat> so we'll end it there. Thank you very much to the panel. A special thank you to uh, Richard for stepping in at, at a very last minute. Um, and thank you to all of, the, of you for joining us and your questions. Um, yeah, thank you very much and stay safe. Thank you. Cheers, Thanks all. Thank you. Thanks.